What's up, Parker? Hey. True faced here. Everything that we were taught about XJWs and non-witnesses growing up couldn't be more false. We've only been removed from the organization for about a year, and we've already met so many amazing people. We're looking forward to developing real relationships with real people, yourself included. Believe it or not, I didn't always have long hair and a beard. Once upon a time, I was a clean-cut elder son. You know, there's this common misconception that everyone who leaves the Jehovah's Witness organization does so because they want to go out into the world, right? They just want to be sinners. Well, the truth is, for many of us, I mean, many of us didn't even get disfellowshipped. Myself included, I was never disfellowshipped. A lot of us simply discovered that the truth was not as truthful as we were led to believe. Wait a second. I'm not about to listen to some bitter apostate. You know, me and my friends, we, uh, we've kind of reclaimed the word apostate. But that's not really what we are. We're simply people who disagree with the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Nothing more. And, you know, I find it strange... And you should too, quite frankly. How how hard the governing body hammers into their members. They seem incredibly concerned with you listening to ex-members or people who disagree with their teachings. Almost to the point to where, well, it's, it's scary to them. So don't be bogged down on these apostates and be careful on the internet. Uh, we were talking about that this weekend with friends. Oh, my word, uh, how many times do I have to tell you, be careful? You know, going here, going there, they'll suck you in. See, uh, with some of this stuff, it can seem so innocent. We're just warning you that all we can do is admonish. Stick with what we have authorized. You'll be safe. You want to go out there? You get a sense that there's some supernatural power behind an apostate. Right? Like we're demon-possessed and we have the powers of Satan. And if you just listen to us for a minute, it'll be stolen away, right? How could it be that Satan the devil is so powerful that he can undo the entire lifetime that you've spent with the influence of Jehovah in your life? It's almost as if the governing body believes that Satan is more powerful than Jehovah. Do they think that you're stupid, that you won't be able to discern when I'm lying to you? That, that seems to be what they, they teach. That seems to be what they truly believe. Is that you're dumb. You can't tell if I lie to you. I think you're smarter than that. And I think that what I have to say to you in this video is worth a listen. And I encourage and even challenge all of you if you think that I've lied about anything in this video, let me know. Call me out, and I'll be happy to reply. You know, my father was an elder for over a decade, and I'll never forget what he used to say to me every day as he dropped me off for school. He would say, son, remember, be a leader, not a follower. Those were sage words. I mean, it's good It's good advice, and I valued it. I still value it, even though being a leader has never really come naturally to me, and it's something that I've struggled with. I couldn't help but see the irony in those words. If your dad was an elder, he was a leader, and he didn't give in to the pressures and temptations of the world, and he led the congregation, so... Very true on both points. You see, while my father was a leader in the congregation, the words and counsel that he gave to those members, the sheep, the flock of the congregation, were not his own words. They were not his own advice. But rather, all of that advice came down from those seven men in New York, the leaders of the organization, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. 
that's not true. All of our counsel comes from the Bible. That's not entirely true. Think about it. How many times have you heard in the Jehovah's Witness organization that no one can just read the Bible alone and come to an accurate understanding of God? By itself, the scriptures were not clear enough. That's that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses say in their literature and during their meetings. That's the entire reason why we went on Bible studies. Was it not? Was it not so that we could go along with the information given to us by the members of the governing body to help us understand the correct view of the Bible and what it all means? The counsel that they give, the counsel that the elders use, is not 100% their own, and it's not 100% from the Bible. It's an interpretation of the scriptures. So hopefully you can see now that, yes, their counsel does, in a way, come from the Bible. It's really the interpretation that means everything. And they expect a strict adherence to their interpretation. If you falter, even a little, you could be labeled an apostate. Which is madness, considering that they themselves have changed their interpretation of the scriptures countless times. They flip-flopped on doctrines and changed their mind about things. And they call it new light. I have a problem with that. I have a, I have a problem with the concept of new light and God revealing himself over time. It would be one thing if they were silent on issues and then suddenly they had an understanding that they presented to the congregations. Maybe you could say that that was God revealing things to them slowly over time. But the fact of the matter is they are actually going back on things that they used to believe and changing their mind about the details. That's, that's another way of saying they were wrong before, now they're right, and they expect you to accept that and believe that. Well, I have news for you. If what they taught before was wrong, that wasn't light at all. The light is not getting brighter. If before they believed something wrong, now they got it right. No, well, that's not the light getting brighter. That's the room becoming less dark. So, yeah, the governing body expects you to have faith in their interpretation and stick to it strictly. They expect you to base your entire life around what they think about the scriptures. And it leads you to the question, do you believe that the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses have Jehovah's divine authority? Well, there's something I would really like to share with you. So, uh, <laughs> I was born in 86, right? And uh, back in the 90s, this book was a big deal. Reasoning from the Scriptures. Um, <laughs> if you uh, open it up there to the front page, the index, and look at the list, uh, table of contents... Go down and look for where it says false prophets. And it gives you a page number 132. By the way, this book, it was it was such an interesting thing. It was designed to be a script, a, a book of rebuttals for any questions or issues that people in the ministry might have regarding Jehovah's Witnesses and their beliefs. It was meant to help the witnesses answer quickly so that they didn't make a fool of themselves and and the fact that their members needed this book to answer these questions that people might have correctly well <laughs> I mean it, it, it it's a little weird right it does raise some red flags I think never mind that okay so false prophets Page 132. So you flip over to page 132, but you don't stop there. 
That's just where the false prophecy starts to be discussed. Flip over a few more pages. to page 136 and you're going to be looking at the subheading have not Jehovah's Witnesses made errors in their teachings we're predominantly looking at the very first paragraph here and it says Jehovah's Witnesses do not claim to be inspired prophets they have made mistakes like the Apostles of Jesus Christ they have at times had some wrong expectations. Yeah, okay. So... Well, just bear with me here. The reason I bring it up is because time and time again growing up, I heard the account of Korah and Moses. You remember how Korah started to murmur against Moses and the leadership that God had appointed over their little congregation, right? And so what happened? Well, Korah and his murmurers, they were swallowed up by the earth. They were miraculously destroyed by Jehovah God because they did not respect that headship. The problem is, there's a key difference, isn't there? Based on what this book says from the Jehovah's Witnesses' own mouths, they do not claim to be inspired prophets like Moses which means all they are is just earnest Bible students. There's nothing that separates them from, say, you or I. They are just imperfect men trying to figure out things the best they can. So with that in mind, it's interesting that the governing body chose to sort of put pressure on us and make us afraid to question their direction, their headship, considering that key difference. They're nothing like Moses. They admit it themselves. No, that's not true. The governing body is the faithful and discreet slave. Ah, ah yes, Matthew chapter 24, the faithful and discreet slave. You know, if you read that entire chapter, it's pretty easy to see that Jesus was using that parable just to help his listeners stay on the watch for his coming. That's, that's literally all that verse was about. I can't think of any other religious organization that read that verse and woke up one morning and decided that it applied to them and them alone, and it gave them some special authority over people. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, so they're not inspired prophets, but because they decided that that verse had a greater fulfillment to apply to them, they have this honorable mention as the faithful and discreet slave. Does that, does that somehow give them the right and the ability and the authority to tell you every aspect of your life how you should respond to situations based upon their interpretation of the Bible? Mm, that's a good question, I think. And it's one that's worth considering. To do that, you kind of need to weigh the evidence, don't you? Well, you can see the proof that we're Jehovah's chosen people because we're the only ones who go door to door around the globe. And look at how warm and loving we are. You know, I used to agree with you when I was a witness. I thought that the Jehovah's Witnesses were the only ones going around the world preaching their beliefs, but as I got older, I realized how ridiculous that notion is. I'm not here to promote any belief system or religious group, but the Catholics, for one, pretty sure that they've been going around doing missionary work and what have you for, well, longer than the Jehovah's Witnesses have, that's for sure. And as far as them being a loving people, true on the surface, it does seem as though there is an, an intense amount of love among the members of the congregation until you dig a little deeper. If those two points are your main evidence for why the governing body and the Jehovah's Witnesses have God's divine authority, well, then you may want to consider the counterpoint to all this. 
And that is the, all the evidence that they definitely do not have God's divine authority. How about the $4,000 a day that they're paying in California to conceal their pedophile list? Yeah, the alleged victim's claims an elder at a local kingdom hall molested him when he was just eight years old. The victim's attorney asked the religious group for documents that might show a pattern of abuse. The Jehovah's Witnesses refused and now face a big financial penalty. Attorney Erwin Zonkin obtained these internal documents in his effort to hold the Jehovah's Witnesses responsible for the alleged molestation. He agreed not to share this information with reporters or the public after receiving it, but when Zonkin requested additional documents, the religious group, also known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, refused, defying a judge's order arguing in part that the First Amendment and religious liberties make those documents confidential. Judge Richard Strauss disagreed and last year imposed a fine of $4,000 a day for every day the organization didn't release the documents. Zalkin says those sanctions now total $2 million. The Watchtower appealed in the district court just announced its decision. In a 39-page ruling, the three justices agreed that Watchtower refused to follow valid court orders and must now pay that $2 million penalty. Well, this is a public safety issue. There are molesters that are still out there that nobody knows about that have been kept secret within this organization. The Watchtower $66 million class action lawsuit in Canada right now because of their policies regarding child sexual abuse. And tonight, a City News exclusive, this is a $66 million class action lawsuit that's been filed against a religious organization best known for its door-to-door -door proselytizing. The Jehovah's Witnesses accused of having rules and policies that protect child sex abusers and put children in harm's way. This is an issue that the wider communities should be concerned with as a result of their procedures when abuse allegations come forward. Um, these sexual offenders are left at large in the community. I know this is not this is not apostate propaganda. I know okay. this for a fact, not because I read it in some apostate website. Okay, I actually have a friend who's a part of the sixty-six million dollar class action lawsuit. I know abuse victims. This is as real as it gets, and you don't have to take my word for it. All you got to do is look at the court cases, look at the Australian Royal Commission. The government in Australia did an investigation on child sexual abuse and religious organizations, and you'll be pretty shocked at some of the findings. Over a thousand pedophiles who were not reported to the authorities in Australia within the Jehovah's Witness organization. You may be saying, well, other organizations has way more of a pedophile problem than the Jehovah's Witnesses. M maybe, but remember the Jehovah's Witnesses is a small group compared to these other religious organizations. you got to consider the ratio there. But not only that, but you also have to consider that the Jehovah's Witnesses are pretty unique given that they have a handbook that they give to their elders around the world. And it instructs them how to deal with every instance that might come up in the congregation. It's given to the elders, and women aren't supposed to read it. It's only supposed to be in the hands of the elders, remember. It's called Shepherd the Flock. And this guidebook has a sentence, a paragraph, dealing with child sexual abuse. In it, it says that if a child comes to the elders, or the parent of a child comes to the elders with allegations of child sexual abuse. If the person who's being accused denies these allegations, they say, well, where's your second witness? They need a second witness to the wrongdoing before they'll take these allegations to the authorities. The matter gets left in the hands of Jehovah, which, as you can imagine, there's rarely a second witness to a child sexual abuse case. No one, and I mean no one, wants someone who's innocent 
and wrongly accused to go to jail. That's not what we're talking about here. The fact of the matter is, if there's no evidence to support an accusation, a person will be fine. Right? Here's the thing. The authorities are the only people who are qualified, trained, and have the resources available to discover the truth of these allegations, to gather evidence, to find out if these allegations are truthful or not. Is it this, this group of people, the governing body, who admits they are not inspired by God, they have set up a judicial committees of, of, of people who they've never met before in these congregations around the world who none of them are qualified to deal with these matters at all. And they've put them they've put them all in a position of authority to decide whether or not your kid is telling the truth about a case of child sexual abuse. <laughs> um forgive me, but that sounds absurd. And why is Jehovah God more concerned with the slim chance that someone might be wrongfully accused than he is the safety, the health, and well-being of children? you got to wonder if it isn't more about an image. Trying to protect the image and reputation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's why me and my friends do the things that we do. Not because we're bitter, angry apostates. But because people, these witnesses, are in these congregations. And oftentimes they have no idea how bad this pedophile problem is. If they did, if they turned on the news. And if more elders actually went to the authorities. And this stuff started hitting the newspapers. These pedophiles started to actually be turned in there would be a pretty huge exodus from the organization, wouldn't there? When you see this failure of Jehovah's Holy Spirit acting and directing the congregations, failing its people, failing its children. Clearly you don't have the right heart condition. If Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong, then no one else is right. And you'd have nothing to hope for. Where would you go? There's nothing else there. You know, I get that all the time. That I have no hope. <laughs> and it's funny to me every time I hear it because the Jehovah's Witnesses are the ones that are basically waiting for this world to fail. You have millions of people around the world in this organization who are eagerly expecting the demise of this system of things. And yet, I'm the one who has no hope. <laughs> On the contrary, I, I see that the world gets worse, but sometimes it gets better, as it has since the dawn of time. I want things to get better. I want to see my fellow man do better and do right by his fellow man. And to make the world a better place, I want my kids to live in a world where people are challenging each other to do great things for the community and for the future, not waiting around for Armageddon. It may seem hopeless. It may seem hopeless when you leave the organization, if you choose to. It may seem like you've lost all your friends, you know? And you've lost all your family. You may feel cold and alone at first. You think, well, nobody out here is any good. These are all just wicked, hateful people. There, There is darkness and there is... There are people in this world who will wrong you if you give them the chance. I'll not deny that. But there are also some wonderful people in this world, too. I've, I've made friends for life. I mean, you talk about brothers and sisters. Well, the friends that I have now, they're not going to drop me just because I 
change my mind on some doctrine. These people, they know me. They know the real me. And not just the surface value one, the phony one that I put on when I go to the meeting on Sunday that I discard as soon as I get home. No. These people have decided, based upon the real me, that they want to be a part of my life. That's, that's a true connection. That's unconditional love. Don't take my word for it. See for yourself. Being in the world sucks. Please take me back, Jehovah. Please. When I decided I wanted to leave the organization, I was told by people that I loved that the world was a cold, dark, lonely place and it would chew me up and spit me out and that I would come running back to them. Well, unfortunately for them, the world is not what they think it is. Hi everybody, my name is Maggie and my YouTube channel is The Apostate Family. I took me and my two daughters out of the organization about nine years ago and we've been active in the ex Jehovah's Witness community for about a year now. Um, and in that year, I've made so many lifelong friends um, and had so much encouragement and support from everybody. And they really showed me what unconditional love is. Um, we talk every day and we're the biggest support system. We have each other's back and um, we talk each other through all our problems. And it, this truly is the best life. It's, it's amazing. It's full of people who love you unconditionally. Um, it's such a variety of people that are out there and especially in the ex Jehovah's Witness community it's, it's amazing they connect with you on a, on a level that nobody else could ever connect with you on and uh, I'm very grateful to all of my new friends that I found out in this cold dark scary world that have been supportive and loving and I just it's a new family and, and so far I have not uh, become demon possessed or um, <laughs> or any of that weird stuff that the Jehovah's Witnesses think will happen. Hi, my name's Josh. Uh, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. When you're in, of course, you're not allowed to associate with anybody else. And when you finally do get out, it's almost kind of scary to engage with other people. But I've been out for about six or so years now. And what I've found is that there are still good and just like in the organization, there's good people and there's bad people. And the friends that I've made since I've been out have been some of the best friends I've ever met that cross the line from what I would consider friends into family. People who accept us for who we are, not our belief system. Conditional relationships are what Jehovah's Witnesses are all about. And that's something that you don't have to deal with when you leave. We want to stress to any Jehovah's Witnesses out there who may be afraid of being alone, trust us, you won't be. We've all been there, and we're all here for all you guys. Life does get better. Much better. Bye guys. Much love.